So, yes, it's recording. So, <laughs> welcome everybody. Good morning, good night, and good afternoon. Welcome to the Vitor Pordeus channel in YouTube. Uh, today, it's a very special occasion. We are doing a transmission, uh, and a live transmission from Canada uh, with uh, Professor Jason Guzder, who uh, I have the honor and the privilege to be my professor. I had been uh, working with her in the last five years, which is the time since I arrived in, in Montreal and we have been uh, working in uh, community mental health, culture, transcultural psychiatry. Dr. Guzder is a very uh, special uh, Canadian uh, citizen. She comes from a family of Hindi uh, background. She's a third generation in Canada. And she uh, be became a physician uh, uh, in, in, in a different trajectory that, that is not, was never common in her family. So she went to McGill when she was 19 years old, right? And she studied medicine in McGill and became a psychiatrist there. And she had always been an artist too. Now before get, getting into medical school, she was already an artist. And one of the key uh, learnings that Dr. Guzder has taught me is this idea of art as self-healing. And this has been something that she had been practicing in her uh, clinical career, in her medical career, in her psychiatric ca career. She also worked as a psychoanalyst and she was uh, one of the key figures in the construction of the clinical uh, service for transcultural uh, psychiatry in the Jewish General Hospital, where she also started the service of uh, uh, child psychiatry, uh, where she had been directing it uh, for long decades in the last uh, 30 years. And uh, she, now she, she's uh, in British Columbia, right, in, in, the, in the Pacific coast of Canada, uh, facing this uh, lockdown and facing this pandemic. So welcome, Dr. Guzder. And if you want to uh, speak to our public and as an introduc introduction of yourself. Um, well, I'll just correct uh, one or two things. One is that I, I was uh, very fortunate to work in child psychiatry at the Jewish General for most of my career. And then I became the head of the department and so on. But the reason I mentioned that is because the, 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 that center at the Jewish General actually uh, was born, uh, the Jewish itself was born because of discrimination towards Jewish people in Montreal. So it is a really interesting beginning to that hospital, by the way, in the 1950s, and has become one of the largest uh, public hospitals in the city and in Quebec. And the child section was started by an analyst, uh, Ron Feldman, who believed in, uh, in uh, group uh, treatment. And we developed a day hospital model to treat children from all over. So we have always used and tra trained people in uh, art therapy, drama therapy, group work, uh, and community liaison between the hospital and the community. So, and this all had to come from initiatives. We had to build our own building. We had to, we had to network. So I am used to the struggles of trying to uh, put forward that prevention is so much more important that is family-based for children and for communities and our role as physicians in policy making. So this was the same principle with the cultural consultation service when we started it at the Jewish General with Dr. Kermeyer doing the research framework and I was doing the clinical framework. It was to reach out into the community to offer a different model of care to address something that was missing, the use of interpreters, the appreciation of minorities, in a province that had been through a massive cultural revolution to become a Francophone nation, essentially, yes. which included healthcare, which involved exclusion uh, for many reasons and access for minorities. Exactly. And out of that work uh, and uh, a tremendous amount of experience I got with refugees and in the child section, 
a lot of experience with the Caribbean minority because they were at very high risk. And with other ethnic minorities who had been there for some time but acculturated in very different ways. So I just wanted to say that yeah. about that. Yeah, it's, a, it's already a very important uh, issue in a moment uh, like we are living because uh, we have been uh, hearing the reports and my own patients here, your own patients in Montreal, uh, showing how uh, those uh, marginalized uh, populations and, and, and vulnerable populations, they are at increased risk now. Uh, they, they, we, we already knew that they had increased risk for uh, mental diseases, a higher morbid mortality, and this COVID pandemics and the frailty of the health systems now puts those populations uh, who actually need special transcultural uh, approaches let's say, uh, special pedagogies in order that we don't harm them né, during the, the process. Now it's uh, being announced everywhere how uh, marginalized populations, vulnerable populations in the United States and here in Brazil is very remarkable how uh, most of the patients who are suffering in public hospitals now are from black communities, and poor communities from the peripheries and high, have higher mortalities. So as a Brazilian, and I think you as a Canadian, had we had always, uh, I think I started early too thinking about this, but we had always been thinking of how can we make a medicine in such a transcultural background, isn't it? How can we make medical practice in, in psychiatry, and especially psychiatry, isn't it? where you're dealing with subjectivities and cultures and uh, the way people go ill and the way people heal is different in each culture. So in a moment like this, uh, we are seeing in the news how those uh, vulnerable populations are being uh, harmed and neglected and uh, once again uh, experiencing higher um, uh, burdens of disease. So how do you think your experience in transcultural psychiatry has uh, helped to mediate this uh, environment. Um, are you talking about uh, now or are you talking about uh, during my time in Montreal? Because they're two different things. Yes. In, a way, in a way, the COVID crisis is an opportunity because the actual marginalization of the minorities has actually forced a kind of recognition about the structural violence of how we organize medical care. We are very fortunate in Canada because we have a socialized medical system. Even a socialized medical system has to be very sensitive to how things are done for access. And so vulnerable populations, especially people who don't trust the mainstream or the dominant culture, such as the black population, uh, felt that they were very uh, marginalized uh, for many years and other groups may feel that they are not uh, really uh, welcome in the same way in certain ways. So we have done a lot of work on cultural safety in the work that has uh, unfolded in cultural psychiatry as very fundamental. That is, it's about understanding that the community has to teach us about cultural safety we have to respond in a way that co-constructs it. So that means language, it means understanding how the community functions and listening to them and allowing them a certain amount of autonomy because some communities like the Caribbean community in Montreal has had to develop their own autonomous services because the black community simply does not trust after so many years of prejudice. Uh, access and they and this is a compound of 400 years of post-slavery trauma yes. uh, and so on so the, so everything has also to be broken down into its in it, its pieces and its history yes. right now we have an opportunity to say well looking at the United States for example where there's such disparity for the minorities and yes. it's clear that the black and marginalized and the uh, about to be deported and the newly migrated 
are the most uh, uh, affected with the disadvantage and poverty. Poverty still takes the highest amount of our attention in psychiatry also yeah. as a factor for abuse, for frustration, for many things which interfere with wellness and resilience. So we can never forget the social disadvantage and it's compounded, I think you're saying, by other kinds of histories uh, that exclude people or undermine trust and undermine collective engagement. And that depends on where you live and what your predicament is. Um, just that would be my comment on that. Yeah, sure. It's a, it's a very, uh, it's a known, it's a known phenomenon uh, that now it's amplified. And how do you think COVID is an opportunity to uh, uh, raise né, this debate on mental health promotion and the arts? You know, né, I, I, we, are, we are talking about this, né, the images and the movies and how all that have uh, uh, we know uh, clinical effects and it, it, we, we know now we have been following many cases where people change their uh, behavior and their way uh, to pre proceed after they engage in cultural action after in cultural uh, movements so how do you see that well you know it's very interesting to learn from how different communities have approached this crisis as an opportunity or not as an opportunity. I mean, Italy was completely blindsided by the rapid way that COVID came into North Italy. And so they were really caught unawares and they were already dealing with a lot of issues that had to do with uh, outsiders and so on. So they, that is the kind of a special situation. But supposing you took the state of Kerala in India, which actually has seen uh, very low rates of COVID because it was so well managed at a community level and uh, women and the regular population is mobilized already to work as a community and they are highly educated. Kerala is one of the only states in India that has 100% literacy. They're very open to, a bit, they have very high quality of medical service and they did not have the same issues as other states where superstitions and chaos and and huge numbers of migrant workers without any documentation, without any homes, were suddenly abandoned by the government, uh, food security was not looked after, etc. So we also have to say that in certain communities which are highly organized and functional already, COVID was a different kind of, of uh, community engagement. And so when we talk about opportunities, it is, it is what does a crisis like this help us to see about who is left out and who suffers uh, and who is disadvantaged? Certainly we know that the elite have a huge gap in America with those who are in need. We also know that half of the people in these very affected areas, whether it's the UK or whatever, manage well because they have already got some kind of self-care strategies they don't watch the news very much they have they have a, a warm families or they have they have already developed interior resources and they have a different kind of presence but but the other more than 50 percent are really uh ha coping with very great difficulties and then another small subgroup are actually so anxious that they are having uh, very high risk behaviors, which as you know, are abuse, child abuse, uh, domestic abuse, yes. um, uh, issues with isolation. And of course the older people are the large 90% of the uh, deaths right now in Canada are the older population over 60. So that's a whole other issue. But I'm just saying that we can never take something and generalize it. We have to look at the, at the at the possibilities and the strengths and difficulties and in a place like Jamaica for example where they've tried to do uh, they've tried to look at community mental health as a as a local engagement yes. they've managed to do their lockdowns in areas where there was outbursts and so on so 
so it's not the it's not only about poverty it's about how you've organized medical service and access and how you've taken uh, care of the disadvantaged yes that looks like a concept for community medicine isn't it Jelena? community health that the, the idea of autonomy you know, and organization and, and critical thinking. You know, I'm very uh, impressed by my country you now and my community and the way things are uh, uh, unfolding here in Brazil because it looks that uh, the, uh, you know, the very basic critical thinking is not working. People, they, they have some, it looks like a psychotic state, né? Which are like a monologue, an ongoing monologue, a fanatic monologue, and then you have wars uh, uh, between monologues, and that leads to fanatis, fanatism and uh, escalation of violence and escalation of, you know, bizarre uh, political events that is going on here so it's it's very interesting when you, you talk about this uh, the, the generation of internal resources and how uh, the human being needs to hit, to have those internal resources in order to 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 cope with such a, a, a complicated uh, situation so i think this also touches the 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 issue of the arts né? and 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 the subjectivity and the building of subjectivity and and how you as an artist first of all as a painter and plastic artist uh, being exhibited in all over the world and artistic residency in the museo laboratorio della mente of rome now with dr pompeo martelli just recently you've been to berlin in the savi gallery also now showing your work so uh, as an artist first and and then as a psychiatrist how do you think the arts uh, uh, move with that and how do you think the arts may harm people too isn't it now we know that art can heal but we know that art can harm too isn't it and in, in a, such a society of mass culture and you know uh, all those violent uh, entertainments that the masses use it well yes i think you're right i mean technology can uh, be can open up uh, vast areas that are very helpful to us as a society but they also it has its its shadow side as you know with cyberbullying with with uh, a whole new generation of people who don't read who uh, who have a shorter attention span in some cases uh, etc. So that we don't know actually all of what Marshall McLuhan's uh, revolution on uh, communication implies to the deeper levels of collective uh, uh, organization because this new generation that is coming is very skilled at technology uh, unlike our generation but we even we are uh, trying to keep up with but nonetheless there's opportunities in it and I think um, I'm not so we're, I, I'm not so keen on unpacking what is pathological at this moment, but what are um, what are the options that people have for development, and and in this uh, in this in this movement to making access possible by platforms, can it give us any uh, helpful aspects? of generating sharing of ideas uh, of dialogic methods of uh, exchange of connection um, which can be used for working groups because after all working groups only exist for various kinds of tasks and this two-year period of covid because that's the projection of how long we're going to be struggling with this uh, epidemic uh, minimally uh, we really have to get our act together in terms of what are we going to transmit as skills because, for example, for health and for generating health, sports is very important for us. Physical activity is very important. And for children, group activities are essential for the development of the mind and social skills and self-regulation. And none of that can be done 
with uh, in isolation on a Zoom camera. There, it's not possible. And in addition, parents who are already very fragile and who are looking and facing economic uh, hardship uh, or have already had fragile relationships are in a more, even more vulnerable position. So we have also to think about how do you support community at a time like this? And so most people are saying, well, we are going to, we are going to send the younger children to school because they, they are not as affected by the epidemic. Uh, and we're missing an opportunity for their development if we don't do that. But we have great worries about the older ones, et cetera. So these are very complex things that you're talking about. Art in itself for an individual person is a great healing space, in my opinion. And it, like if you're a poet where you have mastery of poesis or uh, your area is music, or you remember I'm seeing those pictures of the Italians singing concerts on their balconies to connect with their neighbors or, or in uh, stories about the indigenous communities in rural BC where, where the elders are very isolated. The young people took drums and went from house to house and drumming wow. um, and phoned the elders, you see, and used. So, the, so that how people can create connection is also very important through the arts. And, uh, you know, so I, I don't know if that's the direction of your comment, uh, but... Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a, this is a, a, it's a challenging field, isn't it? Because it's not clear, uh, and we as researchers of the field, we know it's a complicated uh, debate in, in public health. It's a complicated debate on mental health promotion, public mental health promotion. Many times we, we have the feeling that the system is promoting disease, you know, mental disease, and harming, and traumatizing, and re-traumatizing uh, the media, you know, the way the media presents the news, and uh, counting each death, and scaring people. So this uh, all uh, may bring uh, this issue of, uh, of psychological experience of the media, isn't it? But we also have experience uh, of of mental health promotion through uh, engaging in, well, there is an issue that we were talking before. It's the issue that the person has to be the artist, isn't it? You have to be involved in producing in, uh, and, and, and generating something and generating an image. Anise da Silveira, she will talk about the, the images, how all this results in images, and images are emotions. So ultimately, if we are producing images, we are producing emotions. And, and, and this applied into movies and internet movies might uh, uh, help us to think about this medium is the message and how uh, the media's impact né, on, on human health so uh, I think that you as a painter né, and, and, and as a family therapist and as a person who observes the two uh, fields of the images and the human emotions at the same time, uh, how do you use the arts in your clinical practice to, for, for illustrating uh, to the public? Well, that's a complicated um, question because, first of all, there's art making from in my own work, which is my personal work as an artist. Um, and I want to make a comment about that because when COVID started, I was actually in a Zen retreat with my monk, and uh, we only do calligraphy and meditation during that week when I was in the, in the convent. And that uh, then, as soon as I came out of this, then we were in lockdown. So this was a very precious gift for me, actually, to prepare myself uh, for what he teaches. And that is that you don't, it is about going slow and being mindful, but it is also about focus. And, and it is not about what images you necessarily produce. It is about the freedom to actually create and uh, feel some joy in whatever the art 
making is about, whether it's pottery or cooking or whatever you decide is your medium. <laughs> um, but for us, it was the brush and the ink and calligraphy. And so uh, even an Enzo, which is simply like this, a moment is considered to be enough. That is, if you are very sophisticated, then we are going on to the other issues. But so I'm, that's one issue, which is how simple we can be. Then there's the opposite of that, which is if you're a, an actor or you're in theater, this is terribly crippling because it's a group activity from which you get the essence of the growth and the stimulation and the health and the well-being. And that we're very starved of by this isolation uh, mandate, um, which is going to continue for some time because social distancing is part of the strategy. Um, we'll have to see how we can adapt this. For young children, it is not so much of an issue because they are not uh, get, getting sick from the virus as toxically as the older ones might be or the university. So we have to see what, what suits the situation. Uh, that is just a comment on this idea of, because uh, you, you said so many things, I was a bit confused about the question, um, uh, which is because I'm thinking of something like Dreamer World in Jamaica, which was really a, an engagement with the children in theater and performance and music, but we cannot do anything at the moment. We can't even offer the healthy structure of a school day. We can't offer uh, food to the children who are actually not being fed, except if they went to school, etc. So we have pretty dire issues to deal with first. In the long run, we might want to think, is this important for us to rethink? Uh, what are the conditions for resilience? Because resilience is not a quality that somebody is born with. It actually comes out of and evolves out of factors in our own uh, capacities, but also the setting in which we live uh, and how it is constantly affecting us and creating options for resilience. So I think COVID has forced us since the Spanish flu was the last time that we had such a massive encounter with, the, with this kind of epidemic, and that was a long time ago. Um, uh, what can we learn going forward when the schools do reopen and when people are going to be turned? Uh, how will we heal our communities and what could we gain by rethinking what we want to give as tools? Uh, because mental health is always going to be about task shifting. There are never going to be enough psychiatrists. I am not interested in how many child psychiatrists anybody's ever going to produce because we're, we're such a tiny group. It's like saying, uh, well, psychoanalysis is going to, the number of psychoanalysts is going to help the population. That is not true. These are, we have to think of mental health as something about mental wellness, about community, about the social suffering level and then and divide our attempts uh, to look very carefully if we can understand risk and we can understand prevention, what role could the arts or tools of that sort have in terms of well-being? Because we want to keep children and adults as resilient and well as we can. Yes, I've been thinking a lot, Jason, about an idea of like a preventive psychiatry, you know? that enters into the shadowy experiences and the traumas and, you know, the child abuse, as you were saying, and the culture, you know, the, 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 the patriarchal culture. You, you debate it through the plays, the movies, the singing, the dancing, the cultural engagement, the community. This is my feeling, you know. I have had a few patients uh, who have who were having like psychotic crises before starting the engagement. And after they entered the engagement, they don't go into crisis anymore. So it works as a prevention because you 
are uh, debating the shadows, né? you are debating the fears, the tragedies that make so many people freak out uh, through this environment of the, uh, the, the healing space of art. Well, I think that but part of what you're saying has to do with another level of this, which is leadership in the world and, and whether uh, whether we are getting messages that we that we have to filter as populations and in various parts of the world these have become it's very clear to us that the politicization of mental health is is has never been so vividly clear to us as it is now because now we can see that personality disorders in our leaders and um, uh, vulnerabilities of populations that have to do with historical or disadvantage and social suffering that was already there are very relevant to what is happening and and our moral crisis as a society as societies and moral distress that are are we have we neglected our elderly people who have, are dying in nursing homes, for example, in, in Canada, how much we have neglected them. We have neglected the workers who look after them. We have never paid them adequately. Um, we have forgotten whole sections of society and rendered them invisible because there's no fire that makes the elite think that we have to look after them today. So indigenous people and people who are very elderly, etc., have now come into focus as our most vulnerable areas. So that is helpful to a society because now we all need to think a little bit about what does that mean as a society? How does one weigh that? And, and that in case of COVID, I think, and I, when I listen to my American colleagues, some of them are quite depressed by the inequities in the social space and they feel that there is a great moral distress amongst them about the division between those who have and those who do not have and in addition to other things so so it's actually a very complex thing the phenomena that is unfolding because it's not about one person has the facts it's about what is going on in your community that you as an individual or as a family can engage with that helps you to feel safer and more in charge of your own uh, ability to care for your family. Yes. And your... Yeah, I think uh, it's a, this is the challenge. Now, this, uh, I would, I would, uh, putting in the perspective of family and community health, this is the key challenge. Now, how can we promote uh, resilience and autonomy in, in the communities. And I think uh, we also covered the, the idea of mental health promotion through the arts and dialogic methods and the participation of community. You uh, cited the, the uh, Jamaican uh, project that is very important in this field of, of, of school, community, youth, youth at risk. And, and so I, when I look at it and I hear you and I hear Fred and I visited Fred last uh, February in the, the Global Mental Health Conference, I, I feel this is the way, there is no doubt that this is the way. We, we have uh, clinical results showing, consistent and continued clinical results showing that this is the pathway. Uh, I think uh, you also spoke about the challenges of online né, and understanding the, 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 the medium is the message. Né, the, the, the Canadian scientist Marshall McLuhan uh, said uh, this, that I have great implications to our field. Uh, and so I think we can pass to the concluding remarks of our talk. And uh, uh, for me, Jasmine, this is extremely important because without mental health promotion, people will never be able to coordinate action and political action and collective organization. So I think that all this that we debated and the ways to uh, escape are a, a building block. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a stone. Mental health may be a basis 
I, well, being a, a mental health worker and also a, a social activist and popular education uh, person in Brazil, I always see how groups and collectivities, they uh, fail because of mental health. At some point, always there is some eruption of madness, of fights, of competitions. And I think that if we had the promotion of mental health as an orientation, and we, we, we cannot miss it. Uh, I think the groups would succeed and cooperate more and then we could have more social cohesion. So I think this is a, you know, a way to, uh, to propose a, a concrete né, a way to approach the, the, the problem. Né? Mental health is exploding in every, every field, even in the government, as you were saying. So well, I think it's, I think it's a, a great concern that, that we are uh, in a situation at the moment of crisis and not like when we were in February even meeting in Jamaica, we were still uh, aware that the crisis might come, but it had not come. And now the framework is very different. Governments are interested in this now because the ripple effect is domestic violence, death, um, uh, vulnerability of elders, uh, children out of school. Uh, there's a great deal of concern about depression, uh, the economic depression. Um, so there are more stressors accumulating and part of it is driven by uncertainty. It, uncertainty is very difficult for any collective or any human being to handle on a sustained basis. And so what, what we are really looking at is all the ways in which each community can um, manage this sense of being held together and as you say maintaining the simple rules of hygiene and care and so uh, that's that's it that's a lip that's only one level of it the higher level of it is uh, whether i will defy it whether i really care enough about myself uh, uh whether the circumstances in which i live give me no say I mean, migrant workers who were sent off in, in uh, hundreds of thousands uh, running in India, running, uh, this, this was, uh, it's, it's, it's a way to generate massive uh, epidemic. And so, so we are learning as we go uh, that uh, each jurisdiction has very different uh, people in charge who are leading and leadership is very important in a family or in a community there have to be champions who are on the side of the people in in the most disadvantaged as well as the people who are managing and this is a very difficult uh, thing it's not my job as you say our job in mental health is to reflect as much as we can uh, how, what tools are available to us and what are transportable tools, what are affordable tools and what, and who is going to uh, generate the kind of situations where these tools could be used. So this, so this is all unfolding and that's why I mentioned the Jamaica project because we had no resources absolutely no resources and we had a huge and massive mental health problem of violence and murder and it was resting on 400 years of slavery yes. and it was resting on a history that accounts for the defiance and accounts for the rage and and now we are in a different era a, a sort of a different situation but nonetheless those issues have not gone away and so uh, we are dealing with a, a time when community champions uh, are become very important and uh, the sanity of uh, small is beautiful yes. because something that is manageable and is working is 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 what is going to help exactly. better to supervise 10 people and have competence in that group and have them dispersed into the community than to not give anybody training. Yes. 
Yeah, it's changing the direction and to bring bot on top. Uh, the, this is Paulo Freire. And, and task shifting and economics and uh, social suffering, uh, which, which we have to say in the profession of psychiatry, which, which bent itself towards biological psychiatry for so long, has in a way to balance itself that indeed psychiatry and mental health is not only about the immune system and the biology and the genetics and the vulnerable periods. It's about the situations in which the body and the mind can no longer uh, uh, function in a way that is healthy. And, and we're much more interested in transdiagnostic issues, that is through the life cycle, what is it that helps people to be well as opposed to be vulnerable? How is it that cultures give you resilience? Um, how can we amplify what cultures have, have done for generations and thousands of years that is healthy, that we could mobilize and use because it is there ready to be uh, used in reserve? Yes. These are local knowledge. Local knowledge is more important than the knowledge of the outsider. Yes, wonderful, Jasmine. Thank you, thank you very much. I think this is uh, a beautiful uh, definition for a mental health promotion, for public mental health promotion, community mental health promotion, which is the issue, the challenge. And I hope uh, this talk may inspire people uh, and show that it's possible, isn't it? We, we can do it, we have experiences. The problem indeed is the level of uh, competition and madness and, and, and psychotic and monologues né, that uh, possess the, the political scenes and then no uh, reason can exist. Né? But we keep struggling and we keep resisting. So, uh, Jason, if you want to do your concluding remarks about our talk, I think we have almost one hour uh, speaking. So. I, I, I think it's a lot to ask anybody to listen to such a rambling talk. Um, I, I think people really these days need very short and concise <laughs> things to watch yeah, because... We are yes, offering dialogue, you know? This we're offering dialogue, okay. Because uh, I, I, I really do think that we have lessons to learn from community engagement. And I think the Jamaica project for me, I learned a great deal about community engagement. And I think it's the same for the indigenous populations here who are very isolated and, very, uh, and have very high rates of mental disturbance due to their history uh, of the genocide and, and various kinds of marginalizations. Uh, we have always to look at what is there that is positive and that is res that we can build on the resilience for. That's why I gave the example of the youth with the drumming and the elders. That uh, so it it tells you that nonetheless the elders have a very important place in the indigenous society, and that drumming is one of the essential art uh, healers. It has been in Africa and also here. To join, to join people together. It is the rhythm of the cardiac, uh, you know, it is really important. So as you say, it's a, so uh, anyway, I'm, I'm hoping that your dialogues will be about inspiring and looking, why is it working in Kerala and not working in the rest of India? Why, why is, uh, what, what is it about the way we've marginalized the elderly who are debilitated? What is it about the minorities who cannot access care that we have to address? In other words, it's helping us to identify systemically things that we have to take responsibility for and not to alarm people and how to make boundaries. Only as there's only a certain amount of time that one can be exposed to toxic, violent messages, whether it's in an interpersonal relationship or whether it's from a leader or whatever it is. And so we, 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 this is about establishing self-care. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, wonderful. Wonderful, Jasmine, I, it's a beautiful message. The wounded healer, that self-care is the image of the wounded healer. 
Yes. So, so thank you very much, Jasmine. I have no words to thank you for your wiseness and your, your orientation. Your, you know, you are always providing us with lucidity. You know, it's such a crazy field as psychiatry. You know, psychiatry is a very crazy field. We, we, we have you as a, as a lucid voice, as a lucid voice and a person with experience, with clinical experience, with community work, community work outside Canada, community uh, work in many different cultures in Nepal, in India. So I think this is a, a very precious experience, a very precious learning that you have accumulated. And I want to thank you again uh, one, once more for sharing with us and debating those pressing issues that you know, I have to tell you, I've, I have been debating with a lot of people from immunology, from epidemiology, you know, my past colleagues and uh, normal scientists, they absolutely don't see what is going on in, in this field of, of the mental field and the psychiatric field and the community and the collective. So I, I get scared of how alienated scientists can become and uh, do in, um, well, it's not just scientists so it's it's if we look at the world burden of mental health care children receive less than one percent of the budget less than one percent it's unbelievable and yet 25 percent of lifelong diagnoses are made in childhood and this is like uh, the uh, like i have a brother who's autistic and has all kind of problems since he's an infant and and many people live in their families with these issues all through the life cycle. So the invisibility of mental health disability as a burden of care, which is measured, of course, by DALIs and all of this thing, has shown us that we have an opportunity to reduce the burden of mental health disability. And this kind of situation only makes it more important that we be focused on what are the one or two or three things that we need to accomplish that are preventive at the same time that they are generating wellness. And how do we generate the possibilities for resilience? Because we have to come out of probably a very, very difficult time of strain and depression and loss and yeah, grief. Right. And grieving is, of course, a very high level of maturation for us to handle. And it is much easier to be angry and violent and act out and destroy things in our frustration than it is to grieve and to, to be able to absorb and feel that you have absorbed your wound and now you can reflect on it. We want to offer the possibility of reflection and dialogue because the leadership is out there in the community. It is not going to come only from us, it has to come from the community. I really believe it's a partnership. And if we, don't, if we miss it by being authoritarian and rigid and inflexible, that is a great sadness. Yes. Because we've lost a chance to work with community. Yes, wonderful, Thank wonderful. Thank you very much, Jess. very inspiring. This is the, the vision. I think we, we, I'll, I'll publish it and it will have a good uh, repercussion. So thank you very much, Master Jasmine. Uh, we keep... Um, I'm sorry, it's such a rambling interview, but anyway, it's, be, it's always good to talk to you. No, it's my pleasure. And uh, I'll, I'll stop the recording and we, we follow the... So thank yeah. you, bye everybody. And share, share the video, uh, uh, subscribe to the channel and uh, help uh, uh, spreading these ideas of mental health promotion and community. This is the time. The time is now. Thank you very much, Jasmine. Thank, Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.